Welcome all of us for our morning Bible study. We said we will dedicate this morning Bible study to look at some of the principles that govern uh, spiritual leadership. In our morning services, that's what we are looking at. Uh, we looked at uh, redeeming time the first time, not misusing your time in things that don't help you towards your goal or accomplishing your assignment, but investing your time in things that will uh, equip you towards accomplishing assignment. Then the second thing we looked at was humility, that yielding under the power of the word of God and uh, the Holy Spirit, it will be easy for you to achieve your purposes. So let's today go to Second Timothy chapter 2 and try to glean there some things, very important things that are there. We'll read it from verse 1 to verse 7 and see what we can pick from there. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. And verse 7, consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So we want to pick some very important leadership principles from this passage here. Is a a very renowned passage when it comes to teaching on leadership. And most of you maybe have heard it elsewhere. But I want you to just engage this passage briefly. This is a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Uh, Timothy was the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And uh, at that time he was a very young man with uh, a huge responsibility of pastoring the church in Ephesus. Now the challenge was this. Even the church in Ephesus was a young church. It was not a mature church with mature people who know what they need to do. It was a, a young church that had just been planted and Paul was asking for order in the young church. And therefore he calls on Timothy. He says, you, this is Timothy, the pastor, who was the leader of that church, he points out to him, you, Timothy, so you, therefore, my son. When he calls him my son, uh, it does not mean that, uh, that Paul is the one who sired Timothy, but it means that Timothy has chosen to submit himself under the ministry of Paul. Take that very important. Timothy has chosen to submit himself under the leadership of Paul. When Paul met Timothy, Timothy was a young man. He was already born again. So even the word son does not refer to the fact that it's Paul who led him into salvation. No. It just means that Timothy has chosen intentionally to submit under the ministry of Paul. So spiritual sonship involves yielding to the ministry of those that you design. God has brought them in your life for the purpose of instructing you, guiding you, uh, molding you into what God wants you to become. So you, you intentionally, you choose. And you'll see as we go down to this passage, it's not something so easy. It's because it looks almost sacrificial. You choose that I am going to submit myself under the leadership of this servant of God. And that's what Paul is calling Timothy, my son. I just want to take you to a, a parallel passage that, let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. You see what Paul, how Paul defines Timothy. Then you will understand the meaning of sonship. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you 
shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know you are stead. So when you see this, there's a place that the apostle is supposed to be going personally. The apostle is needed there personally. But he has the confidence to say, I trust in the Lord that in a short while I'll be sending Timothy to you. And when I send Timothy to you, he will come back to me and give me a report of the mission that I send him to accomplish. And I will be encouraged when I hear how you are doing. So you see that he has been sent on a mission, but when he comes back, he comes back and gives a report on the mission that he has been sent to. And Paul says, this is very encouraging. So you follow this up. In verse 20, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. So Paul says, he has a ministry. Paul himself has a ministry. And uh, Timothy has understood uh, the ministry of Paul by walking with Paul and serving Paul. Timothy has understood the ministry of Paul to the level that he is now like-minded with Paul. He is like-minded with the apostle. Like-minded. He wants to achieve the purpose of the apostle. That's why the Paul can confidently say somewhere else, follow me or imitate me as I imitate Christ. The young man has come to a level that his ministry is to achieve the goals that the apostle has. He's like-minded with the apostle. If the apostle wants the gospel to preach somewhere, Timothy can go and preach. If the apostle wants administration to be done somewhere, Timothy can go and do administration. Whatever the apostle needs to be done, Timothy is very available and like-minded with the apostle and he can go and do it. Now look at verse 20. Verse 20 is very interesting. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Okay, caring for your state. Verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. In Timothy's ministry, there is no self-seeking. There's no selfishness. Everything he does is to the glory and honor and, and, and um, the majesty of Christ Jesus. He wants Christ to be praised. The glory and the honor and the praise of Christ Jesus. So everything he does is never like, uh, do they appreciate me? Do they know how much I've done? Do they know that I'm the only one serving here? Do they? He, he's never concerned with himself. The danger of spiritual leadership is that most people, when God starts uh, manifesting through us, we start thinking that we are the one who are doing it and we puff up and we want people to appreciate us, people to fear us, people to honor us. Every time you serve as a spiritual leader, the glory, the honor, and the praise must be unto God. Amen. The moment you start seeking for what is in for you, how comes I've not been recognized and I'm the one who did this? How comes I've not been, uh, people didn't even clap when I was talking and when so and so came to talk, people clapped. How comes the, when the pastor went away, I'm not the one, I'm the guy here, I'm not the one who has been asked to, um, you've missed it. You've missed it. It's never about you, your accomplishments, your ability, your efforts, your performance has nothing to do with the spiritual leadership. That's why God picks things that are despised and uses them. You heard a man say, can anything good come from Nazareth? God uses the unlikely sources to minister to his people. Because those who want to puff up, he leaves them puff up. But he uses very unlikely sources. God looks at a heart that is inclined to him and him alone. That's what he says here. For all, Paul has known so many people, but all the other people that he knows, they seek their own. They are selfish. They want to establish their own empires. They're not building the kingdom of Christ. So they seek their own. They want to build their own name. They want to be known. They want to be popular. They want to be celebrities. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Verse 22. But you know his proven character. You cannot say you are a minister of Christ with a rotten character. There's no ministry without character. You know, when we embrace the gospel of grace, 
we say the gospel of grace is not character modification. And I've preached that several times. But the gospel of grace is not telling a, a drunkard, stop drinking, be a good person, then come to Jesus. That's not the gospel. The gospel is come to Jesus the way you are. That's what Christ said in Matthew 11, 27, 28, 29. Come to me the way you are. That's what the gospel says. Come to me the way you are. You're a drunkard, come the way you are. You're a prostitute, come the way you are. Believe that those burdens that you have, Christ paid for you at the cross. After that, you will be saved. Jesus told the woman who was brought to him because of sexual immorality, he told her, since those who wanted to kill you have gone away, since you have escaped death because you came to Christ Jesus, you're not dying anymore. Now, go. But, sin no more. It's not character modification as you come in, but once you are in, there's a need for character modification. There's a need for transformation. There are people who come in, then they want to remain with the same baggage they came with. You see? And it's true of the church. We have many people in the church who are perennial liars. We have many people in the church who are... You know, we have many people in church who are so many things. Eh? If you want to know you are in a good church... Try and drop a thousand shillings behind and keep quiet. See if someone will tell you, brother, excuse me. Or someone will push it slowly with the shoe, slowly. Hallelujah, God, you have answered my prayers. So we have all characters in the church. But, but uh, as we hear the word of God, believe the word of God, and apply it in our personal life, there is transformation from one level of glory to another level of glory. One good thing with, uh, here, Paul is saying, Timothy has a proven character. Now, when he says a proven character, who has proved it? People can testify. People who know Timothy can testify and say, we know this young man. We know he's a prayerful person. We know he's a good teacher of the word of God. We know he's submissive. We know he loves the Lord. We know People can look at him and say, we know he cares for people. Because Paul has said up there, there is a man who cares for people. We know he cares for people. He despises no one. He, he is his patient. You know, people can give testimonies of Timothy. Of Timothy. Because people do. And surprisingly, not even believers, the world does observe you more than anybody else. Haven't you heard people of the world saying, he's a Christian and he's behaving like this. So how can someone who believes in God do this? All our neighbors have put burdens on you. So there's a standard that the world expects from believers in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying is proven character. That as a son with his father, now I've heard many people saying, you know, now we only have one father. God is our father. It's just rebellion. You will never see that God until you die or get raptured. It's rebellion. Paul is referring to Timothy as a son and Paul himself as a father. In the faith. In the faith, we have sonship. We have that relationship of father, son. And it's just a submission to authority. That's all. That's all. I hope you are looking at the, the characteristics of Timothy there. That as a son and the father, he served with me in the gospel. With me means that alongside, alongside Paul, with me. For Paul to reach this conclusion that this man is a true son, in the gospel, in the faith, he has served with him. And Paul is very specific in the gospel. So that's the man that Paul is now uh, is instructing here. You therefore, my son. You can see why Paul can confidently call him my son. You therefore, my son. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Wow. Tell him, be strong. He's not sending him to the gym. He's not sending him to a prayer mountain somewhere to go and pray. He's not telling him fast. Seek the power of God, no? He's telling him, hey, be strong. But as you are strong, you need to understand it's never about what you are able to do. It's about the unmerited favor of God working through you. Because if God was to choose a pastor of this church, I think I'll be the least qualified. I'll be the least qualified. I know myself. There are things about me that you don't know, but I know myself. I'll be the least qualified person to be the pastor of this church. But I understand it's the grace of God at work through me. And therefore, 
I am not qualified unless God qualifies me. You know why Paul can talk about this? That be strong in the grace of God? Sarah, give me a First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 and 10. I want you to see why Paul can say, be strong, my son, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Look at it. Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, for I am the least of the apostles. The least of the apostles. What Paul is saying here is that after me, there's no other apostle. He says, who I am not worthy to be called an apostle. Look at his mindset. He said, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. No, he says, I'm the least of the apostles, which means he acknowledges the fact that he is an apostle. So he's least among the apostles. He acknowledges, I am an apostle. But he says, concerning my way of life, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. If it was to be qualified, then I don't deserve it. I don't have the quality to be called an apostle. And he knows himself. I'll show you one of the things that he has done that he knows himself. He says, because I persecuted the church of God. So he says, how do I serve the same body that I have been persecuting? Unless God has just graciously favored me with his kindness, with his mercy, beyond what I will ever, ever earn or merit in life, God has just chosen me to serve him. I remember when I was uh, the other side, two pastors came to visit me in my house and they are telling me they want me to get born again. So I went into my pocket. I gave them 500 shillings each. I told them I think you need God more than I do. Now, for God to pick someone like that and make him a pastor, it must be grace. It must be grace. I used to wonder, how can a man put on a suit and go to stand before people and just yell for a whole one hour? Don't you have anything better to do in life? <laughs> now I'm the yeller. Paul says, because I persecuted the church, he knows he is not worthy to be called a, an apostle. He doesn't qualify. He doesn't have what it takes. But he says, he knows why also because he persecuted the church. But then he drops down and says, but by the grace of God. You see that? Now he can advise uh, Timothy, you therefore my son, although you are young, you may be not schooled, well schooled, you may come from a small family, you may not be well exposed, but be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. One of the greatest statements in the Bible. By the grace of God, I am what I am. For you to reach that level, you know, you know people have, have qualification. I, I sit among his pastors. They have PhDs in, in theology. They have masters in theology. I, they have a 20 years experience. Pastors will tell you why they deserve to be called men of God. So there's that understanding that by the grace of God, I am what I am. So that you know you don't need qualifications from men for you to be what God wants you to be. And it says, and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me, chose with me. Paul is saying, if you put me in the same house with Peter, then Peter qualifies to be the apostle because he walked with the Lord. All the other 11, they qualify. They are qualified. I am the least when it comes to qualification. But when God gave me his grace to be an apostle, I also did not just sit there and wait. I labored. Now with the grace of God, you serve him with everything that you are and everything that you have. With the grace of God. So when Paul advises Timothy, be strong in the grace of God. He knows what he's telling him. You remember the first time the apostles heard that there's a man called Paul preaching the gospel? They said he can't be an apostle. They rejected him. And he became bold in the same grace. I think we have done this, but we can go there. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1 and 9 and 10. Paul told them off. He told them, you didn't call me. You didn't call me, so you cannot force me 
to be what I am. Uh, let's, let's go to verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I will not be a born servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I have no ministry of pleasing men. I have no ministry of pleasing men. When you are serving God, if you want people to clap for you, you will never serve God. You will serve the interests of the people. But let me tell you the truth. When you serve God diligently, then the people are ministered to. And when people are ministered to, they are blessed, they are edified, they are comforted when you are serving God diligently. So our focus must be to please him who call us. Look at what Paul says here. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we understand that to serve God, to lead. And as I say leader, we have said this several times. All of us here are leaders. There's a place that your leadership is required. Even if it's just in the family, in your small business, at a place of work. There's a place that you'll find that the leadership skills are required. So, And they are the same whether in government or in your house or in the church. Grace is just understanding that it's unmerited. You, know, you have not earned it. It's the kindness of God and the served kindness of God. So let's look at verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is a very important principle of leadership. You know, you can be the keyboard player in the church. And you want to be the only keyboard player, the only star. So that when you are not in the church, the church notices that Andrew is not around. The church suffers. Because the, our, our keyboard player is not around. That is poor leadership. Good leadership is always to pass the concepts that you have to the next person. To the next person. Pass your skills to the next person. Teach another person. I've had bosses who, when they are not in the office, they say something that needs to be done. A car has to be sent. This man is on leave. Send him a car so that he can come and do this for us. That is poor leadership. Good leadership is when you are away, you are never missed. Because you have transferred to other people and it doesn't end up there. You transfer to others, they transfer to others, they transfer to others, so that the process continues throughout. Look at the concept there. And the things that you have heard from me. So what is Paul saying? I have taught you. So the first and most important aspect of leadership is being teachable. Because there are things that Timothy has heard from Paul. In other words, Timothy has a teachable spirit. Learning entails Taking time, taking time to listen to instructions. You know, we, we can be in a church like this and we learn the word of God and uh, the only time you interact with that word of God is when you are seated here and that's all. But you see, you can uh, interact with the word of God here, then with the Berean spirit, go home, take your Bible, study prayerfully, see the things that the man of God has been speaking to us, are they right? Have I got the concept clearly? And when you get stuck somewhere, you can pick a phone and call and say, there's something you taught on Sunday and I didn't understand it. Sally used to do that a long time ago. She'll harass me during the day and we can say, I didn't understand this. And we'll spend a lot of time on the phone explaining what the concept she didn't clearly understand. And I will know if she didn't understand, then many other people in the church may not have understood. So I'll find a way to come and go through the same thing and make it easier for people to understand. You must, first of all, be a student of the word, a student of... Uh, and it's just not the word alone. And that's why we have discipleship in the church. That there is somebody you are looking up to, and this person is a person of character, is a person of, of knowledge. He can guide you, he can mentor you, he can, he can show you 
what you need to do. The word is just one portion of it. But if you have to grow up into leadership, then you need to, they call it an understudy. You need to understand someone. And when you are understanding someone, you, you may look like a slave to that person. So you, you need to understand it, yeah. So you are following someone, looking at his examples, and sometimes you learn from the mistakes he makes. So, and all the things that you have heard, so you reckon there's a learning here. From me, it means you are learning from a specific mentor. You have a mentor. You have someone you are looking unto. Someone you are subjecting yourself to. He said, from me, among many witnesses, now he says, you are not alone. The body of Christ witness you subjecting yourself to that. Here we just have the principle of learning and the person you are learning it from. It's very important because you cannot have everybody teaching you. You'll be a confused person. You know why? Because we are all unique in our own ways. Even in a church like this, if you chose Ben to be your mentor, and you say, I want Ben and Dan Gomba to be my mentors, you'll be confused. Because there's a unique style of Dan Gomba, the unique style of Ben. So there's the aspect of learning and the person you are learning from. But again, after you have learned, it's not private information. It's not for your being knowledgeable and puffing up that you know so much. This you need to transfer to others. But now the people you are transferring to must also be carefully chosen. They must be faithful. They must have proven character, proven uh, commitment to the word of God, proven focus to love Christ and serve Christ. They, they must have some faithfulness. And even faithfulness in the things of this world. And then these men also, once they receive, they'll be able to teach others also. I don't know if you have heard in the, in the secular training of leaders, there's something they call uh, TOT, training of trainers. So at every time we are supposed to be equipping you with the view that you will also equip someone else. Even if it's just the someone you learn from this church or someone you learn from anywhere, and you never ever share it with someone else, uh, sometimes it doesn't help you. If you have been in a class, uh, a formal class, like a college or a university, you see that student who is always willing to guide others in understanding what the teacher was saying? That student always becomes the best in class. Because you know, that student goes beyond what everybody has. So once the teacher has taught, the student must go and uh, internalize what he has been taught, maybe find the teacher and uh, uh, understand this with some concept of clarity, then have a, a group, then teach this group again. So there's, there's nothing as beneficial spiritually as that which you learn teaching to others. Teaching to others. Try that. Even if it's just what you learn in, this, in the church, teach it to others. We will also be able each other's also. So it's a spiral, like a wave that continues to spread so that uh, information is not locked up in one place. If you find yourself in the company of people and you are the only one who is so knowledgeable, you need to find out. Maybe you are in the wrong company of people or you are the wrong person to those people. You cannot just have information bottled up in one place. Information is dissemination. So that other people can also absorb it and disseminate it. Absorb it and pass it on. Absorb it and pass it on. That's what knowledge should be done. The discipline to achieve this, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. As a discipline. Now if you look at soldiers, so many things we can get gleaned from that passage. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of the Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So if we begin climbing this tree from the top, the first thing is that whatsoever you do, you need to understand that it's God who has called you in ministry, not man, and your focus is to please God. Soldiers... I thank God I was, I was never, I never joined that discipline. 
You know, you can get a, a thin man, thin man, who does not even know how to dress properly. You don't like the way he looks like, but is your commander. <laughs> when he says turn left, Derek, can you turn on the right? <laughs> Derek knows this thing. You don't like him. There are things you know about this man that you don't like. But it's the commander. Whatever he says when you're on that parade, you just do it. Because if you do otherwise, you've just lost your job. And yet we are being called again to be like the soldiers of Christ Jesus. So let's just look at this principle quickly. Uh, and then we, we are done. One good thing about soldiers, they always have a unity of thought in whatever they are doing. They are united in their minds. They are united in their minds. And that's the example of the parade. If the commander says, turn left, this must get to help, help. And you see them doing some things. You don't know how they have understood, but they, they have their own language. They have unity in their thinking, in their action. They, they, have, they are of the same mind. You can say they are like-minded. They are like-minded. Only when it comes to service. Because they are not like-minded in everything else. Only when it comes to service and to the one who enlisted them in the uh, as soldiers, they are like-minded. If they are being told attack, they attack. Retreat, they retreat. Go back for refresher training, they go back for refresher training. If you are a recruiter and you are standing in the rain and uh, the one who is taking you through the drills asks you, is it raining? You say, not sir, maybe where you are. And you are in the rain. Because you cannot say it's raining, you mean that your trainer is unfair to you to train you within the rain. So you tell him, no sir, it's only raining where you are. <laughs> we were told of uh, one of them who was the first day she went into training uh, she met a very, very, very bad man at the, at, the, at, the, at the entrance. And the man told her, put your luggage there. So she put her luggage there. Go and cut that grass. So she went and walked around. The only thing she saw was a piece of wood. She came and said, sir, there's no slasher. She was told there's a slasher there. Find the slasher and cut the grass. So the slasher is a piece of wood. And she, the, the, she did it, she did it, she did it. Then she was told, pick your luggage and go. You know, you cannot say no in the army. In the army, there's nothing like I am not able to do it. If you watch how these guys train, my brothers, <laughs> someone came to my, our house and they told my son uh, that uh, he can help him get a, a, a place in the army. So my son inquired, so how does it happen? How is the training? So this person explained everything and my son said, no, thank you. He doesn't like that training. The part of the training is what he hated most. Him, he wants an office to go sit inside and work. So I told him, that's a job. He was told, you're going to begin with this amount of money. He said, I'm sorry. Daddy, I'll not take that one. Because the training of the army, I know what that training does, is to remove self from you. Completely. You never think about yourself. You think about your assignment. These things of your uh, uh, leader in the church are saying that it's, it's, it's very cold outside. There's nothing like that in the army. Or let me wait for the sun to go down. There's nothing like that in the army. You go at the gate of any army camp when it's raining. Do you get a soldier there? There's a soldier there. And he will never complain that I was manning the gate when it was raining. It's only found in the church. And you are being called the soldiers of Jesus Christ. So, the first thing that we look at this, these people from the beginning is endurance. And their endurance is both during training and even during service. But now during training, they endure as they gain skills. During service, they endure not as they gain skills, but, but as they serve in harsh circumstances. They don't serve in... And, and all of us expect protection from the soldiers. When you hear that Al-Shabaab have come in Kenya, what do you think? Where were our soldiers? Where were they? You see? Where are they? Just the same way 
when a church is under some kind of attack, the question is, where, is the, where are the leaders? Where are the leaders in this church? Where are the team leaders? So endurance is important in training. And you endure hardship because you are a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardship because you are a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers are always like-minded. They work together as like-minded. Number two, in, in the army they respond to orders or commands without complaining or asking questions or murmuring. You just respond. What you have been told to do, just do it. Because you know it's within that which is required to be done with a soldier. I, I must put a disclaimer here. Because if you go to a church and you say, oh, we were taught that you must respond to what the pastor commands you to do, and he tells you to put your wallet in the offering basket, that one don't. Because it must be in line. You must understand that when it comes to giving, that's what our kingdom uh, uh, defines how we should give. It says every man should give as he has decided in his mind and be a cheerful giver, not because he has been forced. So you, you understand that. So there are things that you... There must be disclaimers there. So a soldier responds to need, to, to, to commands without questioning. A soldier does what is called unquestioning obedience. A soldier chooses carefully his company. You don't engage yourself in civilian matters. You choose carefully company. Because your company defines who you are. Paul says I've become everything to everyone. Although he says I've become everything to everyone. Let's look at it. Is it First uh, Corinthians chapter nine? He says, "I've become everything to everyone." But this, this, uh, he puts there a disclaimer. Look at verse seven. Paul calls himself a soldier. So he says, "Whoever goes to war at his own expense." So you see, Paul says, "You cannot just decide as a soldier I want to go and fight Uganda. You must have been sent by Uru. You see, so don't go in, in warfare that you." So look at verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. So what is Paul saying? If when you see him entangling or engaging himself with civilians, what is he doing? Preaching the gospel. Because he wants to win them unto Christ Jesus. So that's what he's saying here. Verse 20. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law. Now look at that. That I may win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. Now look at the disclaimer. Not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. So he says, when you see him in a club, it's not because he has lost his senses, he has gone to drink and mess himself up, and uh, look for women and do this kind of thing and smoke. No. He says, if you see me in the club, I still have the law towards God in me. I'm just pursuing that person. To the lawless one, he says, I'm pursuing them with the purpose of winning them to Christ Jesus. Know that I also have become lawless. That's the principle. When you go down to the level of somebody, you're not going there to become a thief like him to win him. No. You're not going to become immoral like him or hard to win him, no. You know you have uh, the law of the spirit of life through Christ Jesus in you and therefore you go there with the strength that God has given you, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You reach that person at his own level but you don't lose your fidelity to Christ Jesus. That's why he's saying a soldier who is engaged in warfare does not entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him. So this is a discipline. This is a discipline. You choose your company. Because bad company always corrupts good manners, good morals. You cannot tell me you spend all your time with people who have bad morals. You spend the whole day with them. You eat with them. You drink with them. You walk with them. And you are telling me, because the Bible says, we can become everything to everyone. No. No, no. The Bible calls upon us to be disciplined. Disciplined soldiers. Disciplined leaders. 
So we will uh, continue pursuing this. I wish you could do it, the whole of it. But the first thing we are looking at here, Paul calling Timothy his son in the faith. And therefore we have said sonship has something to do with submitting yourself to a particular leadership. I think we'll be looking at briefly at it in the main service also. Uh, they have they're intertwined also. Then you have seen him saying that be strong in the grace. We are saying as a leader, you don't use your own energy, your own power, your own might to serve God. You submit yourself to learning the word of God, believing the word of God, applying it in your life. Then the Holy Spirit picks it up and by the grace of God, the undeserved favor, the unmerited uh, kindness of God, you will be able to serve him, not because of your efforts or your performance, but because of what God, God is doing through you. Then here he says, and the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So here also you reckon that whatever skills you attain, whatever knowledge you attain, don't hide it within yourself. Pass it on. I think that's what Christ was saying. Don't light a, your lamp and put it under the table. Make sure that others can see the light also. Pass it on to others. Everything you learn, pass it on to others. So that uh, the, the, the uh, cycle can continue. The ripple effect. You see when you throw a stone in the water, you see the ripple effect. And that's what Christianity should be like. Whatever you learn as a child of God, pass it on to others. And then uh, verse 3 is saying endure, endure hardship. So you see, both in your training, you have to, for, for sake of Zingizi, for you to be trained, <laughs> whatsoever you want to learn, there must be a sacrifice. Sacrifice. I remember when you used to be in the village and you were studying for an exam, the only thing we used to know is to take very cold water and soak your legs inside. I don't know how that used to help. You soak your legs inside and you will study the whole night. Then you bathe cold water and go to school in the morning. And the results were evident. Those who put their feet in water and those who don't do it, the results were evident. So the endurance must be both in training and in service. Both in training and service you will get hardship. Although the hardship of training and the hardship of service, they are different. But you will get hardship. But the Bible says endure uh, a good soldier. And the Bible says now in verse 4, don't just engage yourself with everyone. Be disciplined. Choose your company very well. And if I'm not wrong, if I'm not wrong, you'll find that soldiers always work with fellow soldiers. Unless it's family, unless you find him with his wife, his mother, his brother. If you find a soldier in the company of someone else, it's fellow soldiers. But even in so doing, you are doing what Paul is saying here. He said, to the weak, I became weak as a weak, but I might win the weak. I have become all things. Now look what Paul is saying here. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. I love this statement here. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That's your purpose as a spiritual leader. Next Sunday, we'll be continuing with this to look at uh, the example of athletes. The example of athletes. The discipline of athletes as a leader. We'll look, continue looking at that. Then we'll look at the discipline of a farmer. That's, those are the three disciplines that Paul uses. A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And then you package all of them and put them in the discipline uh, of a leader and it is really helpful it's really helpful amen any question any comment you're the first one to shoot up your hand you have enjoyed the study so i want you, I want you to tell us your name and how you have enjoyed the study thank you pastor my name is uh, bernard ekesa and i've really enjoyed the teachings especially pastor where we have taught about a soldier, the discipline. I think this is where <laughs> I need to work very hard. Because as Christians, sometimes we take grace for granted and we just live our lives the way we want. But this is a very good example to live like a soldier. 
disciplined life. Sometimes people run around. I see some of us Christians running around. We are looking for deliverance, something called deliverance. But actually, <laughs> this is what we need. So thank you so much, Pastor. I'm really blessed. Why don't you put your hands together for Ekesa, Banana Ekesa. Let's all rise to our feet. Dear friend, you may have watched this message and yet you are not born again. It's not an accident, but God's plan. All you need to do now is believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross and settled the penalty for all your sins. When you rely only on this finished work, you become the righteousness of God because all your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God with all the rights of a son. You will never ever perish because you have eternal life, the very life of God. You are welcome to worship with us every Sunday from 10 a.m. We are located at Umoja Inako Estate along Moy Drive, directly opposite the Umoja 2 Chief's Office, Nairobi, Kenya.